Praise God. So, what is a recipe for revival? Isn't this a great bulletin that Amy made? I, I really like it. It's awesome. Looking in the Bible, figuring out how am I going to make this thing. So, the first thing you do when you look at a recipe is you see what you're going to make. So, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave himself some ingredients. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what? See, is that the purpose of the church? To raise up pastors, evangelists, prophets, and pastors and teachers? That's the whole purpose that we come to church. We tithe, and with them we train up these five-fold ministry, and everyone else sits back and watches them do it. No, that is not the purpose. The purpose of the fivefold ministry, let's keep reading, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Who does the ministry? The saints. We all do. The believers. So the purpose of these active ingredients is to get you moving and doing the ministry. It's not so that we sit back and watch them run around and do all the work. Did you know in the church today, 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people? The other 90% just come and attend, sit in a pew, and watch 10% do all the work. That is not the recipe that God's given us in His Word. He gave us the fivefold ministry for us to be activated in our calling and purpose and doing the work of the ministry. So, for the edifying of the saints, the body of Christ, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Tell we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of God, of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, what are we making? What is this recipe for? For us to come into the full measure of Christ. What the purpose of the ministry is that we all, including the fivefold ministry, needs the saints so that we could all come into the fullness of Christ. When we stand before Jesus at the great white throne judgment, he's not going to compare us to the world. He's not going to stand and say, well, you were a little better than all the people in the world, so well done, come on in. That's not what's going to happen. The measurement that he's going to use when he's, we stand before him is Jesus Christ. He's going to say, did you look like Jesus? Did you act like him? Did you talk like him? Did you function like him? Did you minister in the world like him? Everything that we do is going to be measured to Christ. So here we are in the church, and we're looking at the world saying, well, at least I don't do what they do. At least I don't do that, and at least I'm better than this. And Jesus is saying, no, look here. You have to attain to here. Run harder. Run faster. And we're sitting back going, well, I I'm fine because I'm not looking like them. And we are. We just come to church on Sunday and we go to work and they can't tell the difference with our lives. We watch the same movies. We speak the same language. We act the same way. We chase after the same things. We have the same idols they do. We spend the same amount of time on our phone. We go on our lunch break. They sit on their phone and we sit on our phone and we don't look any different. But then we say, well, at least I don't smoke and drink and party and do drugs and sleep around. So I'm good. Jesus is happy with my life. He didn't come and die on the cross and go through that pain and suffering for you to justify yourself. For you to sit back in apathy and go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not doing that stuff. The measurement that we're coming into when Jesus looks at our lives and he's enabling us to attain it, he's not going to call us to something that's inattainable. He's not going to call us to fail. He's going to call us into something that he's going to enable us to attain and do and become. And it says here that we're supposed to become into a perfect man. Now, th does that mean perfect? Yes, it means perfect. It, the Greek word for perfect means absolutely perfect. He, he meant what he said in his word when he wants us to come into fullness. 
He meant what he said, but is he going to leave you to do it by yourself? No, that's Old Testament. No one could do it. No one was righteous enough until Jesus came. But the blood of Jesus enables us to have the Holy Spirit living inside us to then begin to function and grow in maturity. Do we accept Jesus in our, Christ, our heart and then become fully edified in our mind and mature and perfect? No, it's a process, and he knows it's a process. But he's enabling us to stumble towards perfection, as Pastor Mike says. As long as we continue to move forward and progress and stumble and say, that's the goal, I can't attain it by myself, but I'm trusting you, God, that you'll bring me there. And we, can we do it alone? Can we do it by ourselves? Is there Lone Ranger Christianity? From what I just read in Ephesians, there isn't. The fivefold ministry needs the saints, and the saints need the fivefold ministry. We all need each other functioning it in our giftings and callings for us to come into this perfection. We can't just have the fivefold ministry off to the side trying to become perfect because the word says that the, saint, the fivefold ministries equip the saint, and the saints edify the body, and then everyone can come into unity and come into that perfect man. We can't do it alone. So I had a dream about a year ago, and in, this dream was very short but very profound. And I heard a voice, and it said, I am going to show you a recipe for regional revival. That, that was very clear. I heard this voice. And then I saw, I saw these clay pots. Well, I saw clay and seed get mixed together to make clay and water. And then these, these clay lumps of clay began to be, get, be formed by the potter's hand from the inside. And then once those pots were formed into pots, they were put into the fire. And once those pots came out of the fire, they, they burned with that fire continually. And they went out, the pots were then released out into the region where they reproduced the the thing. Each pot went and got another 12 pots. So it started with 12 pots. Those 12 pots after the fire went out and started another 12 pots. And then those 12 pots, after they, they be, became formed and everything, and then you began to see that the whole region caught on fire. That was the end of the dream. I zoom out and saw the whole region catch on fire. So that, that was the dream, and that, that was it. I'm going to show you a recipe for a regional revival. And then I see pots, and I go, God, what does that mean? Because that, that kind of looks random, and, and, and it's so short. And it was like literally a, not even a minute-long dream. And so I'm going to share with you the meaning from Scripture, what God, God gave me. So the seed dies, and it's mixed with clay and water. John 12, 23, Jesus answered and said to them, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for, eternity, for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. For where I am, there my servant will be, will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And then another scripture is that Jesus turns to his disciples and says, that if you are unwilling to take up your cross daily and follow me, then you can't be my servant. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. You cannot be my disciple. And the thing with the cross is, it's not a burden that you have to carry around. Jesus wasn't saying, if you deny yourself and then get a burden, you are too joyful. Peter, you're too happy. Go get a burden. Get that cross and then you bear it and then you say, we all have to carry, bear our crosses, brother. And we have to look sad because we're bearing that cross. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was happy that his disciples were happy. What he was saying is, 
when you saw a person carry a cross back in those days, everyone knew that they later were crucified on that cross. You didn't see them the next day carrying a cross. Oh, there's that guy that walks around carrying a cross a month later. No, he died on that cross. What he was saying is, pick up that cross, crucify your flesh, and then you can follow me. Die to yourself already. He was saying, deny yourself, die to your flesh, then you can follow me. He wasn't saying, get a burden. He was saying, to kill it. Just kill that thing. Stop playing with the sin. Stop playing with the de desires of your flesh. Stop playing the games and kill it already. That's what he was telling his disciples. Crucify that desire on that cross and follow me. So James, the, so the first part is the seed dies and we die to our flesh and we crucify those desires. We stop justifying our sins, we stop making excuses, and we kill it and follow Christ. You know how, how to not walk in the flesh? You know how to kill the desires of the flesh? It's really simple, and we make it really complicated. We make it a 12-step program. We, uh, you go through this process and that process, and then maybe you will be kind of free. You won't ever be able to say you're not an alcoholic, because you can't ever do that. You have 30 years without drinking, but you still stand up and say, Hi, I'm an alcoholic. Why? Because you're constantly fighting and battling the thing. It could come back and it bite you any day around the corner. So you have to confess that you're an alcoholic and you need to keep doing the process. Where Jesus offers true freedom. He offers one step. And you want to know what the step is? Walk in the Spirit. The Bible says that if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Run to Christ, die to yourself, and give your life to Him, and then walk in the Spirit. One step, run to Jesus, and then live. Live with Him, through Him. Walk in the Spirit, not in your own understanding, your own abilities, or your own strength, but walk in the Spirit, relying on His Spirit, on His help. Each day that you get up is a day that I rely on you. So the first step is die. Then the seed gets mixed with clay and dirt. And the Lord told me that that represents humility. So the seed has to die. We have to take on humility. So James 4.4, 4, adulterers and adulteress, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. For he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, adulterers and adulteress, actually, it could mean someone that commits adultery, but it could also mean someone who is unfaithful with God. That they worship idols or chase after the things of this world. So, what James, I believe, in the contents of this scripture is saying, you're being unfaithful with God. You think that you can come to church on Sunday, live your life however you want, Monday to Saturday, be friends with the world, do the things they do, and then come and be all good with God? Do you not know by making yourself a friend of the world, you are choosing to be God's enemy? But, guess what? God gives grace to the humble. He doesn't leave them without a way out. He doesn't say, here's your sin, now live with it. No, he says, here is your heart condition, here is the solution. Become humble, become low, ask for grace, ask for mercy, cry out to God, but be low. Don't become arrogant, oh God, I think I'm good. I don't think God's going to help you at all. It's like the... The prayer of that Pharisee that said, Oh, I thank you, God. I'm not like this man who's a sinner. Oh, I'm so good. And, and, and Jesus and the sinner tax collector said, cries out to God, doesn't even look up to heaven because he feels too low. And says, God, God, help me for I'm a sinner. Jesus says, Which man went home justified? Which one went home just as if he never sinned? 
the arrogant man that said he's thankful he's not like that? Or the one that cried out for mercy so low that he didn't even think he could look up to heaven. He went home, Jesus said, justified. Just as he never sinned because he cried out lowly. But when we come and we say, no, I'm good. I'm not like that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a tax collector. I'm not a thief. I, and we say all the things we're not, but we don't confess the things that we're failing on. Then God can't help us. Because it says, he resists the proud. But he gives grace. Grace is his favor, his hand, his protection, his, his spirit upon us. Grace is the unmerited favor, but we, we can only receive it when we're humble. The Lord showed me that humility is not what some people think that you have to sit in the back and hide from all the people and you can't be like where I am and be humble because you're putting yourself up. I'm not putting myself up. But people think that in order to be humble, I need to hide. A lot of people mix that up and say that humility is someone that no one ever notices and really sees. But Jesus was the most humble person, and he stood up in front of the Pharisees and told them what, what's what. He stood up in front of Pilate and told him what to do. And Pilate says, I'm in authority. I have the right to say what happens to your life. And Jesus stands up and says, you only have authority because my father gave it to you. He was humble in that moment how could he be humble and stand up and be seen and yell things that are true and stand and talk with authority if humility is hiding humility is not hiding humility is complete dependence on god because pride is self-dependence humility is god dependence so even in this moment, I am being humble because I'm fully dependent on God. I don't know what I'm going to say next. I, you, my notes don't have words of what to say next. I'm depending on God to show up and tell me what to say or this thing's going to fall apart. But I know that he loves you so much that he wants you to have a word from him. He's desiring that your life would be impacted today, that you would go home justified, that you wouldn't come to church and leave the same and he loves you and my motivation is out of love not that you would look at me and not that you would see any giftings or ability I don't rely on giftings and ability I rely completely on God he's my helper I don't lean on my own understanding or my own abilities or my own gifts even if they were given by God I don't rely on that I rely on the source no, not the things that come from the source. I rely on him. And that's the definition of humility. We can stand up. We can be bold as lions and completely humble at the same time because we rely on God. So the first part of the dream is the seed dies and becomes humble, completely dependent on the maker. The next is the potter forms the clay from the inside. Isaiah 64, verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. You are the, we are the clay, and you are the potter. And all we are is the work of your hand. See, the world tries to potter us from the outside, tries to conform us. Romans chapter 12 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. What? From the outside? No, from the inside. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. From the inside, the potter reaches in and starts to conform us to his image, starts to tr take out the junk and the garbage that's on the inside. And guess what happens to the outside? It takes form and shape. But he focuses on the inside instead of focusing on the outside. See, the biggest sin in the church is not swearing. Because it's outside. It's, it's visible. Everyone sees. If I came in here swearing like a sailor, you would all go, wow, he's sinning. Like, the, the hidden sin is what God is worried about the most. Like when a sinner first gets saved in an awakening... 
and starts dropping the F-bomb and saying, wow, that guy is effing right, and wow, F this, and, and I, I can't effing believe this. And, he, and the, the people look at Nino and say, Nino, should we take him outside? And Nino says, no, no, that's the highest praise from the lowest place. See, God's not worried about their mouth in that moment. He's worried about their heart. And their heart is being impacted. Their mouth doesn't know how to confess it properly. But they're not going to take him outside because he's being impacted on the inside. Guess what? Two weeks later, he's not swearing. And they never once told them to stop swearing. Why? Because God was conforming him on the inside, transforming his mind. Now his mind doesn't even have those words in there to access them, to say them out loud. Because God is renewing his mind. God is touching our hearts. It's not about conforming our outside appearance, but to transform our hearts and renew our minds. So he's pottering us, reaching in. If you've ever seen a potter on a potter wheel, he, he doesn't focus on the outside or else all he'll get is a, a ball or a blob. He has to put his hand on the inside and start to pull it up and pull it from the inside up and make it reach higher than it could reach. When it started, it was just a lump of clay, only this high from the ground. And he can work that thing, a, a skilled potter can work a lump of clay that big to stand up this high and, and be a beautiful pot. Why? Because he's reaching from the inside. He's conforming from the inside and transforming the shape and everything about that lump of clay and making it something that's useful. So, and then it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For, God, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shone into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Some translation says uh, clay pots. That's what earthen vessels. We have this treasures in clay pots. We are the clay pots that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. What do we have in these clay pots? The full power of God. It says in, in Matthew that he gives his Holy Spirit without measure or without limit. When he gives you his Holy Spirit, he gives you his Holy Spirit. He gives a whole thing. He doesn't say, okay, Pastor Ken, you will have a calling to be a pastor, so I'm going to give you three quarters of the Holy Spirit. But you're a child, so I think you only need a quarter of the Spirit. And, and you, you're a little better. To, no, he doesn't do that. He gives us the whole thing. We have the whole the Holy Spirit living in us when, when we receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't get a limit. We're, we don't, can't look at the next guy and say, well, he's okay. He's preaching up there because he has more of the Holy Spirit than me. I just got 10%, so I'm okay to do nothing and just live my life my own way. No, we get the whole thing. We all get baptized and we come into the family of God. We all have received the high calling of God. And we all are enabled with the Holy Spirit. So, the next, the pots are put in the fire. The pots are put it in the fire. 1 Peter 4.12. Sorry I'm not giving you time to actually turn there. I want to get through this and I have awesome stuff here in it. So I'm just going to just read and you catch up. All right. First Peter 4:12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Do you do not think it's weird. What's going on? What's happening? I'm in a fire. This hurts. Peter says, "Don't think it's strange that you're going through a fiery trial right now." As though some strange thing is happening to you. This is why really weird. I'm a pot. Why are you putting me in the fire, Lord? I don't understand. I was really happy when I was a lump of clay. It was awesome when you turned me into a pot. But I just wanted to stay there comfortable. I was nice and wet and it was all good. I still looked like a pot. I smelled like a pot. Everyone looked around and said, hey, that looks like a pot on the shelf. But guess what? When you put water in that pot, it dissolves. 
But when the pup goes through the fire, it can hold the liquid. It can hold the wine. It can hold the water of the Holy Spirit. But it's not fun for the pot to be thrown in the fire. Do you not think it's strange to go through the fiery trial? But rejoice! Whoa! Rejoice! I think that's strange. To talk to someone that comes up to you and say, Oh, pastor, my life is so difficult right now. And you don't understand how hard it is. And this is happening. And the pastor turns to the person and says, You should rejoice. I don't know if that would go over so well. I don't know if you would have much of a congregation if you did that every time you had an appointment with someone from the church. I don't know how long they would stay, but that was Peter's advice. The, the church writes a letter to Peter and says, it's so difficult. They're persecuting us for Jesus. They're being mean to us. And Peter writes back and says, you shouldn't be feeling really like this is a strange thing, but be happy. We're really happy. Rejoice. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when he, his glory is revealed, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Take your eyes off the temporal, put them on the eternal. When we go through these trials that are trying us, it's for his glory. It's even for our glory. Because when he comes in his glory, he's going to say, you went through that trial and you praised me through it all. You never took your eyes off the cross. You never said, hey, why are you doing to the, this to me? I don't deserve this. You said, God, you really love me because you died on that cross for me. You went through way worse suffering than I could even imagine. This is nothing compared to that. And I'm just going to praise you through this. And guess what? When he comes in his glory, he's going to glorify you. He's going to make you glad with exceeding joy. Paul says, I, it's not even worthy to compare the sufferings of this life to the glory that we're going to receive in the age to come. It can't even compare. It's like a small, minute thing, and we get to spend all eternity with rewards because we went through it. So... James chapter 1, let's turn there. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, my family in Christ, my brothers and sisters in this room, counted all all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy. Not just a little bit of joy. But all of it. Count it towards all joy when lots of problems are coming at you. Uh, yeah, you got one th thing happening. You got one problem there. But James says, count it all joy. Get really, really excited when you're going through more than one thing at the same time. Who knows the enemy likes to throw multiple things at us at the same time? Come on. He wants to get us off track with God. But what if instead of getting off track with God, it was like some turbo fuel and we ran faster towards God? Because that's what it is. He's putting turbo fuel on the road, and we're, we can either choose to get slipped up on it, fall down, and complain that our knee got scraped, or we can take that fuel and run hard to God. How do we do that? We turn it to praise. We praise God in the good times. We praise God when trials come, when difficult situations come, when our children go astray, when the bank is phoning and saying, hey, you're overdue, when all these bills are piling up and you're like, I don't know how to provide for me, and you're living under that stress and that cloud and you don't know how to provide for your family. I, I lived there. I was, I was married. I had a child. And I was like, I don't know how to provide for my family. Then I realized one day I received a revelation from the Lord. I am not the provider of my family. Jehovah Jireh is the provider for my family. He said, I am God the provider. And he is faithful. He's faithful to who? Those that fear his name, that follow him. He's faithful to those that trust in him. 
so in James chapter 2, it says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So who knew, whoever sang the song from Hillsong's Ocean? Okay, anyone? Put up your hand real high. Okay. So did you know that you were asking for trials when you were singing for that, that song? Every time you sang that song, you were asking God, God, please give me lots of trials. <laughs> did you know that? Take me where my faith is without borders. Guess what? You can't get there without trials. You can't get to the place where your faith has no borders, where your hope cannot be disappointed without going through lots of trials. So when you sang that song and you said, God, take me to that place, you are saying, God, give me lots of trials so I can come out on the other side and see that you were faithful and I will have faith and believe because I walked through it. I went through the fire. I stood there and God never left my side. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, these problems happened. It wasn't easy. I never said it would be easy. But he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you every step of the way. And when you get out on the other side, and believe me, there is another side. Some of you are in the middle feeling hopeless. Like there is no other side to this. The problems come one after another after another. And when that one's gone, two more come in its place. But I'm telling you, it is a season. God is with you. He will not forsake you and you will get through it. And when you get through it, you will see the handprints of God all over your life. When you're in the middle of it, you can't always see it. But when you get out, you see that God was faithful. He never left your side. He was there. He was working things together for his good. For those who what? Trust in him. For those that stay faithful. For those that endure to the end. Those that do not give up during the trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work. God, why does it take so long? It's patience. God, you could show up and change this situation today. God, you can do this. Why is it taking so long? God, I know you are able. You are powerful. You created the whole universe with a word. Why is this taking so long? Patience. Because he wants to produce maturity in you. He's trying to change you. He's using these trials to change you in a way that good, wonderful butterflies and, and cozy feelings can never change you. If all you had was cozy, wonderful, warm, cozy life, you would not be mature. You would not come into maturity. You would not be changed like some trials in your life can change you. Like going through the testing of your faith. Like going through the fire. Like those pots are thrown in the fire. It says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. Wow. That's what we read at the beginning. We'll come into the perfect man. How? Through lots of trials and fire and burning away the flesh and crucifying it. Yes, sign me up. I want to be perfect. Be I the power of God. That's where I'm headed. And it's through trials. But it's through our heart attitude. We can waste our trials. Did you know that? You can waste your trials. From heaven's perspective, you can just grumble and, pray and complain and feel sorry for yourself the whole way through your trial. God will still bring you through it because he's faithful. Even when we're faithless, he's faithful. He's going to bring you through this season. But you can waste it. You can waste that season and not give any praise, not give any glory to God, not show the faithfulness of God, not go to your friends and say, hey, I'm having a difficult time, but I know God's going to see me through. You wait and watch. It may take longer than I thought, but you're going to see. You're going to see that, hey, my bank account's down to zero, maybe negative. Hey, these things are coming my way, but guess what, guys? God is faithful. You'll see. You'll see my life turn around. But if we hide and we never show anyone that we're going through the problems, we come to church with a big phony smile on our face. Yes, brother and sister, it's great. God is good. Yeah, all the time. Oh, I hate God. It's not with me right now. Come on. Did you know that hypocrisy is not say, telling someone to do something and not doing it yourself? 
that we're taught in the church that that's what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy is putting on a mask and acting, playing two parts in a play, being one person when everyone's watching and another person when no one's watching. That's hypocrisy. So we come to the church, we don't want to tell anyone about their sin because we're not really perfect ourselves, and then, and then we act like we're good with them. And then we turn out to be the hypocrite when we're trying to avoid to be a hypocrite. Imagine that. So someone offends you, and, and they're, they're obviously in the wrong, they have sin, but you have the same problem, so you don't want to come to and confront them and say, hey, what you did really hurt my feelings, but, you know, I have the same, I get angry too sometimes too, so I, I'm in no really p- good place to pr- correct you because I don't want to be a hypocrite. So instead of going and t- telling them, hey, you offend me when you got angry there, you go, hey, brother, good to see you. I can't stand that guy. He's so annoying. He got angry at me. <laughs> you know, that's what we do. We become the hypocrite trying to avoid to be a hypocrite. Hypocrite... It's not someone that tells someone what to do and not do it themselves. It's someone who acts on a stage. Someone who pretends that I, I'm good with you and we're good with God and everything's good in our life when my life is falling apart. Come on, give God a chance to show his glory through your life, through your trials. So, so, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. So, next. The pots are used to spread the fire. My favorite part. So, Matthew 14, I mean 514. Or right on time. So, You are the light of the world. Can you imagine this? This blew my mind when I read this. It doesn't say, I am the light of the world, because this is Jesus talking. He's talking to his disciples. You are the light of the world, he says. Can you imagine that? Jesus calls his followers the light of the world. Why? Because they have him. They're reflecting him. But He is putting the responsibility of this world having light on his disciples, not on him. See, a lot of times we say that Jesus is the light of the world, and he is. And when we have it in our our heart, we become that light. But he gives the responsibility of this world being in light or darkness to his disciples, not himself. See, Jesus died, rose again, sat on the right hand of Father, and sits there till his enemies become his footstools. Who's making him, his enemies, his footstools? Him or his followers? He's sitting there waiting for us to move. You are the light of the world, he says. You have the responsibility whether this world is in light or darkness. And we're sitting here hiding in the church and saying, God, do something. It's dark out there and I don't want to go shy, go out there. It's scary. I don't want to go talk to those people. They may reject me. Where in the Middle East they may kill you, but here they may just may reject you or ignore you. You are the light of the world. If we look around and we see darkness, it's not God's fault. God has enabled us with the Holy Spirit by giving us the light, by coming and shining and being the example of how to live for us to be the light of the world. So you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see, what? Your faith. They may see your giftings and abilities. They may hear about that prophetic word that that prophet told you two years ago, and you haven't changed at all. That's how they're going to see that you have light, right? No, it says that they may see your good works and glorify what the, your father in heaven that they get this that they are going to look at you 
right? A lot of times we're praying for revival and we expect God to show up with his Holy Spirit and he does and he will and he can. He is sovereign and he can bring revival however he wants. But he has chosen you. You are his chosen people. It's special possession of God. He has chosen you to use you for a purpose. So we expect him to just come and we pray for this and the whole city fall into repentance and conviction and and then receive Jesus and no one will actually have to go out there and talk to those scary people. Right? We're praying, God, show up. God, change the city. God, come on, pour out your Holy Spirit that those sinners over there at 7-Eleven will fill your presence and they'll just repent and none of us will actually have to go over there and talk to them. Come on. You are the light of the world. You go out and shine in the darkness. You shine brightest in the darkness. That they may see you in action. Your good works. That you are moving and flowing and acting. That they don't, they're not going to see your good intentions. Well, I intended to talk to that guy. I, I saw him in a McDonald's across the way, and I, God really put him in my heart, and I intended to talk to him, but I just couldn't find the right moment. So I prayed for him, right? That's good, right? I, right? No. If God put him in your heart, don't have good intentions. Have good actions. Have good works before men that they may glorify your Father. That's all about bringing glory to God. And how do we do it? When we move. It's like when Franco heard, felt in his heart that he should cry out and say to the guy across the street, can you imagine Put yourself in his place. It's a great testimony, but put yourself in his place. You're walking down the street, and you go, I think I should yell out across the street, stop searching, Jesus is the answer. Yeah, I think I should do that. Okay. And Franco stops, and he yells out across the street. He acted. James says, show me your faith without your actions, and I'll show you my faith with actions, because faith is action. Uh, and that it worked, right? He, he was obedient. He opened his mouth. All right, I'm going to ask Alexa to come and open her mouth and share her verse. She has a very special verse for us today. She's going to share in the sermon with me. So everyone, welcome Alexa Shilly. All right, stand right there. All right, here you go. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15:57. Very good. So, I'm going to ask Alexa a couple questions, and I didn't tell her what to say. We, we, we're we just going to ask her the questions and, and see what she comes up with the answers. You know, she prayed about this. We told her to pray. We told her the questions we're going to ask, but we didn't give her the, any answers whatsoever. So, Alexa, what does that verse mean to you? It means that he gave his son so that we could get the prize. And what's the prize? Or how do we apply this to our lives? How do we use this verse to apply to our lives? We give the prize to other people. Very good. And who's the prize? Jesus. That's right. Very good. Thank you, Alexa. So, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So, God, it says here, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bless us with every spiritual blessing. 
No, it says has. It has been done. It already has been given to us. We don't need to run around and look for more qualifications than the blood of Jesus Christ. We cannot get more qualified than having the blood of Jesus by accepting Jesus Christ in our lives. We can't get more qualified than that. We can get more trained. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything, but your qualifications come from being a son or daughter of Christ, of God, through Jesus Christ. That's our qualifications. So we can go to Bible school. We can go to seminary. We can, we can get the training. We can go awesome. Zoe's going to get trained and raised up. But that is not her qualifications. When she's done and she gets that diploma, that doesn't qualify her. The blood of Jesus qualifies her. And that's just training on top of that qualification. But she is qualified because she's a blood-bought daughter of Christ. So our qualification come from God and we already have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We don't need to run around and wait till we have certain amount of spiritual blessings or impartations and, and all of this before we begin to move and act and function in our gifting. We can get saved yesterday and begin to preach the gospel today. We are qualified because of the blood of Jesus, because we become a son and daughter of God. So, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. Which, what does that love look like? John 3, 16, Pastor Ken read it earlier. That love had action, corresponding. We can't say we love the lost if we won't talk to them. We can't say that that God, for our inheritance, give us the lost and then never talk to someone who is lost. We can't say that we have love if love does not come with corresponding actions. I can't say I love my wife and never give her a kiss or a hug. Would she believe that I love her if I never gave her a hug or a kiss? Honey, I love you. I just don't want to touch you or be close to you, okay? Uh, but no, don't get me wrong. I totally love you, okay? And, and let's not hang out during the week. We'll only hang out on Sundays, okay? Isn't that cool? I love you. No, I, I don't think that would go over well. It doesn't go over good with God either. Love with corresponding actions. So God loved us. We love him because he first loved us. His love had corresponding actions. He sent and gave up his best, his only begotten son, that we should have eternal life for all that believe in him. So he loved us. And even when we were dead in trespasses, enemies, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're already there. In the ages to come that he might show you the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith that it is not of yourself, it is the gift of God. That's awesome. There's no amount of work you can do to earn salvation. Nothing. You can't fix your life first. And then when I get good enough, then I'm going to come to God and give him my life. No, he wants your life exactly how it is. You cannot get good enough to get God. It's impossible. That's why he gave his free gift of his son, because of his love. But what is next? A lot of people like to read that verse and stop there. It's not by works, brother. It's by grace. So I don't have to do any works the rest of my life because it's not by works. No, it's not by works that you're saved. But it's with works that you receive the reward and the well done. If you sat back and you were like the servant that hid his coin his talent in the ground and then gave it back to God. Was the master impressed with that? Look, I washed it for you. I gave it back to you. He wasn't impressed that he received what he gave back. He wants us to multiply and to grow. The key, the key principle in the kingdom of God is multiplication, is growth. 
The, the only difference, and switching to another parable, the parable of the sower. The sower went and tossed seeds. I'm going to go fast because we all know this. The only difference between the seed that fell among the thorns and the seed that fell on the good ground, the seed that fell among the thorns grew up. It grew up. It received the word. It got roots. It grew up. It sat in church. It looked like everyone else. But the one difference between the seed that fell among the thorns and the seed that fell on the good ground, it didn't reproduce. It didn't bring fruit. It didn't multiply. That was the one difference. It looked the same. It grew into a nice green stalk and everything, but it never came to fruition. It never brought forth fruit. Are we the seed that fell among the thorns? Are we okay with plateauing in our run with God? Are we okay to say, look, I ran that far, so isn't that good enough? No, we can never be satisfied with what we've done. We always have to press on towards the mark. So, so verse 9, here's the answer to my question. That, that it's, not by gr- it's not by works that we've been saved, but by grace. But verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 2, not of works, lest anyone boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Looking good on the shelf? No, for good works. He has a purpose and a function for you, which God prepared what beforehand that we should walk in them. All of these are action words. There is no room for plateauing. There's no room for not finishing the race, saying, I ran and did lots of good works before, brother. It doesn't matter how much you did yesterday. It's always about today and tomorrow. We always get a new opportunity. Every morning we wake up, is a new opportunity, new grace, new mercy for us to function in the giftings and abilities for his glory. My friend Taylor, story, the one thing that impacted me most that he said in his life, is he, he would get up every morning, he told me, and he would pray and say, God, I'm your humble servant. Use me today. That was his prayer when he first got saved, and it's impacted me ever since. That was his life prayer. In the morning, he would wake up, and he would say, I'm your servant. Just use me today, whatever you want to do. And, and that, was, that was it. That wasn't complicated or intense to our prayer thing he just god here i am use me so i got a picture of emma that i'm gonna show up on the screen there there she is so emma here is a celebrating canada day last year and she's waving her flag and she's having a good time she's really she's laughing and everything see god told me or us prophetically that he has his eye on his this church he has his eyes on us and i asked god what does that mean you have our your eye on us and and he showed me that it's like this when i'm balancing emma on one hand she's around looking at the crowd we were standing in front of the the stand and she's just loving the reaction of the people the ladies go (gasps) and the guys go whoa and she's like yeah at me right but my eyes never leave emma i cannot take my eyes off her for one split second the whole time i'm doing it my entire attention and focus is on emma my eyes are on her completely if she starts to lose her balance i'll catch her but if i look to see the reaction of the people and she loses her balance in that moment i won't have time to catch her My eyes are fixed and focused on Emma. And God said, that's what it's like when you you want my eyes and my attention on you. You have to go. You have to go. It's when the go that my eyes are fixed on you. It's in that extension from that safety where I normally carry her on my hip and I have my arms around her. And I take her out from that safety that my eyes are on her. And God said, my eyes are on you when you go. You won't be alone. You will feel alone. You'll feel alone up there on my hand, but you won't be alone. My eyes will be fixed. My full attention will be on you when you go. 
It's not in the good intention, but it's in the go that he, all of heaven stops and watches and sees, will eternity be impacted today? Will we make the decision today? Today is the day of salvation. And it's in that moment that we go that God's hand and eyes are fixed on us and he's with us ready to move and show up in the miraculous. It's not in the day today. It's not when we're sitting back and living our lives for us that we see God show up. It's in the go. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray that it would go in our hearts, that it would bring fruit fruit, Lord, that we would multiply and that we would grow as a church. It's not okay that we have empty seats, oh God, because you have a message, a word for the people today. You have fresh rhema through your servants, Lord, every week, Lord, and people need to hear it. People need to be raised up in discipleship. The world is getting lost and further from you, oh God. We need to be more fervent and fired up, oh God. I pray that you would place a fire in us, that you would bring revival through us, God. You don't want to just bring revival to us. You want to bring revival through us, Lord, that you would use everyone in this room. I thank you for the remnant that you are saving for such a time as this, that they would begin activated and used for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.